there, Eric Garland here, and I am with my friend, the esteemed energy analyst, Gregor McDonald in Portland, Oregon. How are you doing, Gregor? I'm doing quite well, Eric. We're having a beautiful summer in Portland. Um, you know, I, I have a little sympathy for my friends in the east with all the humidity. We're just having, as, as usual, a very dry summer. I'm riding my bike a lot. It's great. So it is a time of joy for us all. That's wonderful. So for, for, for the people who don't know you and, and what you do, could you just explain quickly who you are? Yeah, so uh, I'm an independent journalist covering uh, energy uh, issues mostly. I've been uh, doing this work for about five years now. Um, I have a blog. Um, I've got a website where I sell a monthly ebook called uh, terrajewel.us. Um, I write for various publications, um, mostly uh, out of London of late. And, um, you know, my, my main interest is, is uh, uh, I'm doing a lot of work on coal at the moment, but uh, I'm also doing a lot of research uh, covering uh, the renewable space. So um, I'm very uh, chock full of data and uh, ready to chat with you today. Excellent. So the big issue I've had, you know, I've been reading you for several years now, and yeah. one of the topics that you're really into is what is commonly referred to as peak oil, mm -hmm. or in mm -hmm. more general terms, energy transition, and that's the one you tend to, pref to prefer. And yeah. for the years that I've been reading people not in the traditional media space, but analysts such as you, Chris Nelder, and other voices that are not represented every day on television or in some of the major newspapers, you know, you get a different narrative, and it's been right. quite fascinating. It's always usually backed up by more data and, and what seems to be a more balanced and complete insight. Uh, and one of the things I've been following in your work and other people's has been we are coming to the end of cheap oil in the way that we have come to expect it in the 20th that's century. Right. Um, and that's commonly referred to as peak oil by, mm -hmm. by some folks. And mm -hmm. so there, that's, uh, that's turns out it's one side of a d debate. There's some people who say there's peak oil and other people are more, I believe the term is cornucopians. There's tons of oil everywhere. The earth mm -hmm. has got nothing but oil and we can use it as fast mm -hmm. as we want. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to true up a couple of things. The other thing I'm reading about these days is how, hey, baby, it's a bull market. S&P 500's posting mm -hmm. record profits. Dow's back up. Man, if things aren't going your way, I mean, I just guess, you know, you just need a little Prozac cocktail or something. you gotta got to get your spirits back up. Everything's, right. uh, forget that 2008 stuff. All this is, it's great. And uh, energy, we got fracking. The United States, did you know the United States is now an energy exporter? It's true. <laughs> I am trying to true up the stuff I read from you <laughs> and the new bulls out there that all of a sudden, all those things that just seem to have so much compelling data about them, they're gone now. So, Gregor, what is the, this tension between peak oil or energy transition and the new abundance we apparently have in energy? Your thoughts? Yeah, okay, so um, these are pretty big complex issues but I'll just I'll just make it uh, let me make a few declarative statements just to uh, help your listeners out here so we are there is we are not yet at peak coal okay we are not yet at peak natural gas all right um, we're not at peak uh, solar or wind power okay Th those are all energy sources or energy technologies that are going to continue to grow um, in quantity and size in the years ahead. Um, we are we are in peak oil. Um, you know what I want to say to people is learn the difference. Okay, learn learn the difference from when when you're in in the domain of peak oil and you're not in the domain of of peak coal or peak natural gas. Um, so do some people take peak? oil as a hyper depressive way of saying oh it's peak, peak energy and there's not going to be energy and we're right. all going to be trying to break the plow break the fields with John Deere plows and oxen and right right I mean we have to we, we, we have to separate all the crazy things that people may have said in the past 
about what the effect of peak oil would be from just the fact of, of peak oil. Okay. I mean, so what is, just so to bring it down to basics, what is peak oil? Yeah, so peak oil has been the prediction for the last decade or two that the world would eventually reach a, a, a moment, or not a single moment in time, but really a period of time, in which the global production of oil would uh, begin to flatten out. Okay, it would begin to it would begin to flatten out, and in that period, you would generally find that the global production of oil, not the production of oil in the United States or the production of oil in Mexico or the production of oil in Russia or Saudi Arabia, the global production of oil, you would reach a point where the uh, volume of oil being produced on an annual basis would begin to flatten out, and you might have some dips in that production, you might have some increases in that production, but essentially you would be hemmed in by geology and price. And that's really where we've been since 2000. Five uh, global oil production reached above uh, about 74 and a half million barrels a day in 2005, and it's been up and down, but roughly at that ceiling um, for the past seven or eight years. And recently, we've seen production levels at 75 million barrels a day, 75 and a half million barrels a day, but again, not really on an annual basis have we seen any significant increases. So oil, oil, global oil production is roughly on this flat plateau and it dips down one or two percent uh, when there's like a financial crisis, it dips up one or two percent um, when the price of oil is high enough to bring on these new expensive resources. So it's, I have to admit, it's, it's tedious for me I've sort of stopped having the debate with people about peak oil. Um, it's it's not a philosophical position. It's not a political position. It's not a um, you know any other sort of uh, uh, type of theoretical position. It's just a it's just a fact. So. Well, okay. So a lot of people fight this. Um, you know, you say it's it's not religious or philosophical. That's right. There's people That's that take two sides of this and the peak oil is made out to be it's the end of oil man it's all going right. away and we're going to be walking everywhere maybe a segue right. if you have batteries for it yeah um and you uh, you're a naturally uh, you're an expert in the things that you study and you're naturally by your disposition not a hysterical person so when you describe a, a flattening you're not even talking about something bombastic even when you say it's happening it, you, you know, it's it's not a super exciting thing. But people fight this this notion that well, well, we might reach a point where we just don't necessarily produce more than we did last year. People fight that like it is, um, you know, you're talking about the end of the color blue or the end of uh, ketchup or something. Yeah, well, you know, it, it's it has been concerning to different people to different degrees. Now, let, let's remember that. You still have your Gregor? Yeah, I'm still here. The, the point I was making was that people talk about peak oil as if you're making a cataclysmic right. prediction and that it is going to be enormously disruptive to the world economy and it's the end and there's going to be repricing and it's, well, you're saying there's going to be $40 a gallon gasoline. That's crazy pants. You're talking about we just don't grow anymore year over year and that might be permanent. Um, why is there this this amount of of emotion in everything? Yeah, so you know it it is somewhat understandable when you when oil has been the master commodity since uh, uh, starting in the Great Depression, oil began to take over from coal. Oil was very cheap and it was a more powerful energy substance. And then World War II really accelerated the transition to oil and and really sort of um, locked in the fact that we would enter an oil age. So it's understandable that if you've had so many decades of history and economic development, it was basically on the back of oil, that people would become understandably very concerned about what would happen when the production of oil would begin to, um, you know, would begin to flatten out. 
Um, but again, I, 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 I do want to point out, you know, in, in the year 2000, at the beginning of the new millennium, uh, if we look at all energy sources for the entire world, oil had a 40% market share. And now oil has a 32% market share. Okay, so when people, again, this is, it's, I, I, I think I need to be a little bit uh, harsh here in order to make my point. When you talk to people or read uh, essays from people who either scoff at peak oil or laugh about peak oil or dismiss it, it's amazing how uniform uh, their message is. It doesn't have data. They don't use numbers. Um, and they're really dismissing things that they don't understand. So the oil age is in rapid decline. Uh, the two billion people in the developed world, that's Japan, U.S., and Europe, stopped increasing their oil consumption uh, over eight years ago. Um, oil is essentially a zero-sum game. So, you know, we, we gave up a tremendous amount of oil over the past uh, decade so that Asia could have oil. You know, this is, this, if, if oil is a zero-sum game, and, and new users in the world are able to pay a higher price, someone else has got to give up that supply. So, you know, this is just classical economics, Eric. Price rations supply, and it has done so. We repriced oil from $25 a barrel to $100 a barrel. We basic, oil basically kicked off a whole bunch of people that used to use oil, and it welcomed a whole bunch of new people uh, to use oil, who were willing to pay the new price. Uh, so, you know, that's that's where we that's where we are now. Just to be very clear, we're never going back to an era where oil will be cheap and more plentiful than it is today. Could we have greater oil supply at 150 or two two hundred dollars a barrel? Probably. We could probably bring off on some new supply at those prices. But we're never going back to $25 oil with plenty of oil for the world. Just it's it's just not possible. Okay, so you <clears throat> you said there you will read um, the responses to peak oil from people who have no data. That's they correct. have a lot of assumptions, a fair correct. amount of emotion. I've read that's, some of these. That's correct. And um, between you and Chris Nelder, you have some of the most amusing commenters. Ever. Yeah, yeah, we 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 do. And again, I. I, when I talk about this, I really like to be clear with people, again, as we kicked off our conversation today, we're not in the domain of peak natural gas. We're not in the domain of peak coal. Of peak coal. I mean, if I was someone who had a philosophical position about calling, you know, the peak of everything, I would probably, you know, hop on board the train that there's peak coal and there's peak, peak natural gas. There isn't. Um, you know, I, I, sadly, if you're concerned about climate, this is uh, very concerning um, that we're nowhere near peak coal, for, for example, um, because it means that the world will have many more decades uh, to come in which it can call upon uh, coal resources. So, um, you know, it's it, that we've got we've got limited oil supply on one hand. That's kind of you know, concerning because it means we can't run the world at the fast speed that we used to run the world, and then we've got um, uh, and then we've got this abundance of coal, unfortunately. So um, we've it, we've entered a new energy era. We are in energy transition, and I just you know at this point I shrug my shoulders if people just don't want to get their head around this, um, then I guess they won't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this last week I saw that they, a very popular website called The Oil Drum is shutting its doors or, or reducing operations. I forget exactly the story, but this caused some people uh, that have been around this space who were on the cornucopian side to say, see, it's, a pr it's proof yeah. that there was nothing to this to begin with. Now. Right. I'm, here's here's my question, who Gregor? Who are these people that are engaging in this debate 
that seems pretty, they, they very much, I've, I've read these arguments, they cherry pick the kinds of data, it's all very, very narrow data. It's like, see, there's shale oil in North Dakota, and see, there's lots, and that's good, and that's why peak oil, which is a, a much broader, I mean, you guys are explaining this in much broader terms, there's, none of it's true, because North Dakota. I mean, it's a weird okay. argument. Who got, who's making these arguments? Who's being paid to do this? You know, why do people b believe this? Okay, so look, Eric, it's, it's always been the case that a national media will cover its own domain. Um, so, you know, London media will cover the UK energy situation much more than it covers the global energy situation. And your typical UK reader will look at the coverage of the UK energy situation. So for example, natural gas is getting more expensive. They have to import natural, more natural gas from Russia. Uh, electricity rates are going up. Uh, nuclear power plants are shutting down. Your typical UK reader will extend the reality of what's happening in their country to the rest of the world. The, the United States is no different in this regard with the increase in U.S. oil production um, in the United States, um, you know, American readers of American media are thinking, well, global oil production must be increasing. I mean, you, you actually see this from professional writers. They'll say, you know, we've got more oil here in the United States, therefore peak oil is dead. But it, it's, it's sort of silly really because somewhere in the world oil production is always increasing and in other parts of the world oil production is always decreasing so and there there are some pretty big spots where where oil production has been de decreasing um, at a very rapid rate my understanding is Cantarell in Mexico and Agawar is that it in eastern Saudi Arabia are the some of the mega fields that are whoop, coming off very very sharply Eric, I have a noise issue here. I don't know if you're picking that up. Do you want me to deal with that? Um, what's the noise uh, in, on your side? Yeah. No, it's not disturbing me. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so uh, look, you know, you, we can divide the world between non-OPEC producers and OPEC producers, okay? I mean, that's just a really easy way to divide. You can just cut up the world into two parts of oil production. There's OPEC and then there's everybody else. So it's great for the economies of North Dakota or Texas that they're producing more oil. And it's great for the United States that we're producing more oil. We're also consuming a lot less oil. But is non-OPEC, of which the U.S. is a part, is non-OPEC producing more oil? Not, as, not so much, actually. Um, in fact, almost 60% of the new oil supply that's coming out of the United States has been uh, neutralized, if you will, by declines from the rest of non-OPEC. So, for example, a typical story you'll see today is OPEC is biting its fingernails, worried about all this supply coming out of North America. OPEC as a cartel is losing power. But you look at the data, there's really nothing for OPEC to be worried about. Um, the amount of oil that's come out of non-OPEC over the past couple of years is maybe 700,000 barrels a day. It's really just not that significant. So you know, we're talking about uh, maybe you know, uh, six or seven or eight tenths of one percent of new supply coming out of non-OPEC. And as you can see, has the price well, of hold oil... On. You're talking about a story in, in a probably a, a well-regarded journal of some sort Oh yes, especially the geopolitical journals like Foreign Policy and a lot of the. Especially this is a, this is especially the kind of inaccurate storytelling that that comes out of the geopolitical complex of Washington D.C. You've just seen a ton of stories about you know, energy power is swinging back to you know North America and OPEC is declining in power. I just see no evidence for that. And that's over seven tenths of a percent in supply. Yeah, exactly. Right. That's a that's a rounding error. Exactly. So exactly. is this just you know and and I um, 
I lived in Washington for 11 years. You know, inaccuracy, right. inaccuracy and fantasy is a big thing there now. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, we we ran some delightful wars. I don't know if you saw that. Yeah. Um, so we're not great. At, we're good at intelligence gathering. We're not good at intelligence analysis. Okay. Um, and you know, it, just in general policy, may this is going to be a bit of a tangent, but just uh, I think to your quote is uh, e economists don't do energy, and foreign policy guys generally. Dick Cheney accepted, don't do energy. It's no. Energy is something that they, they know is important, but it, it, it seems like there's a lot to learn, and it's just there's they're not even in, in, interested in, in understanding what what the real deal is, and so you have people make writing articles in foreign policy or foreign affairs magazine based on six-tenths of one percent swing going up. North America is going to run the show. Yeah, I mean, I mean, if, if you really want to talk about the type of power swing or power shift that's occurred in global energy the past few years, the amount of oil that Americans have stopped consuming because of poor wage growth, because they're not employed, you know, because the economy's not growing, because the price of gasoline is high, that actually outdistances by two to one the amount of new oil that we're producing. So, I mean, if, if the geopolitical complex of Washington wants to write a story about a, a, a pendulum swing of power back to North America, the story they should really be writing is, hey, we're less dependent on global oil because we're using less. I mean, and, and what's funny about this, Eric, is this was always a choice that the United States could have made at any time over the last 40 years. At any time over the last 40 years, the United States could have decided to raise gasoline taxes, invest less in roads, invest more in trains, become more European, and therefore become less dependent on global oil prices and global oil supply. We could have, we could be, we, we could, we could have been sitting here in 1983 saying, isn't it amazing what our country is doing to, to wean itself off of global oil? So, again, this really is not a supply swing. This is really a much more complex set of changes that have largely occurred, uh, as I said, because of, because of price. Now, just let me just link this to one other thing. It is true that the United States has vast coal and natural gas resources, but again, this isn't news. This is, it is not news that, it, that the United States has vast coal resources. It is somewhat news that we're able to extract uh, new natural gas resources using uh, new technology, new drilling technology. That is, that is somewhat new. And, and unsurprisingly, the U.S. economy is transitioning to natural gas. Of course it is because, you know, oil, you know a million BTU in oil at $100 a barrel, you know, costs, we'll just call it 15 or 16, uh, 15 or $16 uh, per million BTU. But a million BTU in natural gas costs, you know, $4 for a million BTU. So, of course, we're going to do whatever we can to transition to natural gas. It's, it's a resource that we're producing, and that's great. You know, that, that's, great for, that's great for the United States. So, again, as I'm sure you're familiar, Eric, everyone wants to squeeze these stories into something extreme, something novel, something singular, you know, something, uh, you know, very epic and so forth. What, what is somewhat epic here is that we are going through an energy transition, and an energy transition has only happened a couple times in the past couple hundred years. We, we went from the age of wood to the age of coal during the time of Adam Smith in the late 1700s. And we went from the age of coal to the age of oil, you know, starting about 100 years ago. And now we're in another energy transition. So it is epic, I suppose, from, from, from that perspective. Um, but, but pretty much everyone in the world is going to have to struggle with this transition for some time, for some time to come. All right. I'd like you to talk about a, a an idea that you brought up that I, I found really, really interesting, that as price goes higher, this may really benefit the Asian economy because 
they actually get more GDP out of each gallon of, uh, of oil. Can, can you elaborate on that? Well, I, I don't know. This is a bit complex. Um, I, here, here's what happens. As price goes higher, the user of oil in the world who is able to use a liter of petrol more efficiently gains a curious advantage. It's not so much that they produce more GDP, but the more efficient user of oil gains advantage, gains a competitive advantage over the less efficient user of oil. Because then they become the agent, if you will, that is in control of this miracle energy dense uh, liquid uh, substance called oil. And they're able to use it um, to benefit their economy. Now, whether or not it creates more GDP, I don't know that I would I don't know that I would say that, but the price revolution exposed, okay, it's sort of like you know the old idea when the tide goes out, you find out who's been swimming naked. When when oil repriced, we found out that in America there were tons and tons, millions and millions of, of users who were just wasting oil. And 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 as how, we, how do you mean wasting oil? How were they well, just spraying it on their flowers? Using the oil or? to using oil for for just pure pleasure, using oil to just drive places to uh, perform repetitive kinds of trips and and so forth. And when and when price uh, when price went through its revolution, price basically told everyone in America, look, if you're not using oil for something that you really need to do, maybe it's time that you stopped using that oil. And that's, ex and that's exactly what's happened. I mean, since, since 2005, which was the peak year of U.S. oil consumption, uh, U.S. oil consumption has fallen by a, by a huge 16%. I mean, Eric, if I had told you in 2002 that the price of oil was going to rise and it would cause U.S. consumption of oil to fall by 16%, I mean... It, it, you know, as the largest consume, oil consuming nation in the world, it just would have almost seemed, you know, uh, like a fantastic story that couldn't possibly be true. Well, and a 16% I mean, drop in the master commodity. Yeah. The demand of yeah. the master commodity in the biggest yeah. economy in the world. That's yeah. cataclysmic. You would have I, been, you know, you, you would have needed to be, you know, dressed like a crazy person and muttering to yourself in the street. And you would have been treated like that if you made right. that kind I mean, of forecast. I mean, the, the the geopolitical complex of Washington probably would have uh, scratched its, you know, pulled on its beard and said, you know, um, it's one thing to, to get off dependence on oil, but it's another thing to have your economy lose so much access to oil. We might actually suffer uh, as a result of so much lost access to oil. And that's, I do think that is what happened. We, we did have an oil shock in 2006 through 2008. We did have a financial crisis. Uh, the financial crisis did not have a single cause. It had multiple causes. And one of those causes was the oil shock. Um, and we've never recovered uh, in terms of our energy use since the, since the oil shock for all the reasons that, you know, your man on the street probably understands. Less people going to work, uh, more people uh, uh, out of work and not employed, especially the number of people underemployed in the United States. Mm. This has had an enormous effect on U.S. oil consumption. So uh, this is literally people just going to work two or three times a week is just sure. different than people going to That's work correct. six times a week. That's correct, of course. That's right. And and they may have lost the job that they commuted uh, you know, 25 or 40 miles for, and they may be working a part-time lower wage job uh, closer to home. Do you think we've seen the end of uh, the SUV? I mean, you said we're going up to 2005 mm -hmm. uh, was the, really the year of the, of the peak. Right. I remember, you know, the late 90s and early 2000s that, um, you know, the SUVs got bigger and bigger, and there sure. it was even a weird cultural thing where, you know, people were very impressed with themselves for driving small petroleum 
con consuming automobiles on petroleum built roads uh, as opposed to people who had slightly larger automobiles and then the people that drove the larger automobiles SUVs and eventually the Hummer which was you know came from a military background um, those people felt that that was somehow a um, a statement about who they were and their insouciance and uh, etc and um, you know the SUV was really ascendant in the United States uh, during that decade um, I remember in 2008 you could not give a Hummer away and you you could not acquire a Prius even with the help of sexual favors and that that dynamic changed a little bit the Prius became more uh, quotidian if you will but the um, Hummer failed to even be uh, to be sold to anybody. The Chinese were going to take it on, which is very symbolic, yeah. um, and then they didn't. And so now the Hummer, the symbol of sort of to the the millennial decades exuberance and oil waste, it now doesn't exist anymore. Do you see any uh, any connection with that? Yeah, of course. I mean, when I moved back from London in 1999, I went to a breakfast place with um, my uh, my wife and my and my father, and this was in Plymouth County, Massachusetts. And there were probably 20 cars uh, in the parking lot, and probably 19 of them were enormous uh, SUVs. I'd been living in London. Uh, uh, petrol was a dollar a gallon at that time, and I had already become very interested in oil at that point. And uh, I just I I knew that that was the extreme. I knew that that was the extreme. That was the extreme low uh, in oil prices, and that was certainly going to be the extreme of uh, SUV adoption. And now, when I go back to that same town. And we're, what, 13 years later, okay, when I go back to that same area in Plymouth County. And this is an area where there are very high incomes. Uh, are there, there are still some legacy SUVs around. However, um, you know, the Priuses and the small compacts and the, and the uh, uh, minis and so forth, they've all made um, a huge return to uh, to that area so yeah I mean that was that was a that, I have to say that was kind of a, a fat pitch Eric that was an, that was an easy one to call ten you know at that time <laughs> yeah. I remember being in Washington DC and in, uh, in Georgetown and I remember uh, the the Hummer had just come out and they had the the different flavors h1 h2 and h3 and there was um, you know a 33 year old Looked to be a wife of somebody of uh, in the lobbyist mm -hmm. trade who was mm -hmm. driving a brand new H2, and the thing was as as big as my living room, and she was trying to parallel park on M Street in Georgetown. Yeah, <laughs> and I looked at this and I said, "This is this is American society." I I can't. And she she just I think she damaged three or four automobiles. Uh, you know, a, a team of oxen. Uh, you know, the the this, uh, the Washington Monument. It was it was it was really tragic, but um, I think you know I thought of this moment as the end. Of, like, how is does anyone not watching this looking how silly this this whole enterprise is? Yeah, well, you know, just um, just just to mention a few corollaries to this whole change. Look, I mean, U.S. oil consumption is back in the vicinity of 1995. Levels, okay, and we're, consumption. We're, consumption is at consumption. 1995 levels. 1995 levels, and we're probably we're still decreasing. So we're probably headed back towards 1990 levels. And what's driving what, that, other than the fact that people aren't? But, but it's a bull market, and it's a recovery. Well, well, let me just say, it syncs up really nicely with U.S. CO2. Uh, you know, with CO2 emissions. I mean, what's kind of interesting is. Uh, you know, I don't want to get too much into this, but I mean, the U.S. didn't sign the U.S. didn't sign up to the Kyoto um, uh, Treaty or the protocols. But actually, because we've reduced our our oil consumption so dramatically, it's somewhat humorous, I guess, that we may actually hit the Kyoto targets by 2020 without actually having intended to, because our uh, because our transport sector is pumping out 
uh, you know, such reduced volumes of, of CO2. Now, you mentioned um, the bull market. Well, let me say this, Eric. Um, the S&P 500 is a very good index of global uh, corporations, many of which are cited here in the United States. And global corporations have enjoyed kind of a, a golden period in an era, era of low interest rates where they're not really hiring, they're not investing, but they're sort of, um, they're sort of collecting rents um, from their existing businesses on a global basis as the 2 billion people in the developed world stagnate, but as the 5 billion people in the developing world continue to move forward. Yes, there's a slowdown in China. Yes, India still needs to get its act together. India always needs to get its act together. But, you know, Africa and other parts of Southeast Asia and the rest of the developing world still chugging along, you know, um, at 4 and 5 and 6% GDP growth. And that's, you know, they, they require power equipment. Um, they're consuming energy. Um, and so, you know, you mentioned the bull market. Yes, it's a the U.S. stock market is really a global stock market, and it, it reflects the fact that here in America, um, you know, those corporations don't really need to hire a lot of Americans, unfortunately. And um, so, you know, it's it's very uh, it's a very weird. I, I think. I think the word weird um, is sort of the right word. It's a, it's a weird era that we're in right now where you have the stock market uh, as strong as it is, um, but of course that's set against low interest rates. Um, and it's really a market that's reflecting the flow of profits on a global basis while the United States uh, tends to stagnate. Absolutely. Hmm. And, and so your final... To, to wrap up your response to the people that are like, ha, it's a bull market, everything's great, and there's tons of energy, and there's going to be even more energy. I mean, if you could just quickly sum up. Um, it is possible as, we, as the world transitions to the power grid, it is possible that we could have a brief five-year period between 2015 and 2020 where we return to a higher rate of growth than this stagnant period. And, and this would really uh, get everyone thinking we'd return to normal. However, the power grid is not going to create the kind of fast-moving global economy that the oil age created. And again, just to loop back to our previous discussion, we're not running, we, we have enough oil to continue oil-based activities, we just don't have an increase in oil supply that would fund new global growth. The new global growth is on the back of the, is on the, back of the power grid, the inputs to the power grid, coal and natural gas and, and renewables. So unfortunately, Eric, um, the world GDP could see a growth spurt in, that, in the second half of this decade. But what worries me is that we might not need, you know, developed world labor in order to create that growth spurt. In other words, the educated uh, people of the United States and Europe and Japan may not be, you know, as critical to creating that growth phase. So unfortunately, I see more, I see more pain and stagnation for OECD labor markets and that's that's a fancy way of saying you know people's you know life quality um, as we head into the end of this decade unfortunately so the the truth about um, peak oil not existing and thus the bull market is going to be unleashed the truth there is that peak oil is still a fact because it's a fact and the bull is not a bull market for everybody that's right. We probably got the sense of. So. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, uh, where can people go for more insight from you on this? Yeah, so I'm doing a monthly um, ebook now, uh, which is uh, macro coverage of global energy. 
Um, it's called terrajewel.us. You can uh, just find that on the internet. And uh, I publish the first of every month. Um, and I've got very good subscriber growth and a lot of readers from outside of uh, the United States. Uh, uh, I was just looking recently, about half my readership is from outside the United States. Um, that's probably a topic for another conversation. Why are so many uh, of my readers from outside the United States? Probably because they're just a little bit better in touch with reality. Um, yeah, that would be my short take. So yeah, yeah. So people can people can come get my ebook at uh, terrajewel.us, and uh, I've got a new issue coming up uh, August first. It's covering uh, the big things that I think are going to happen in natural gas markets. So. Natural gas, and you have a dandy data feed at peakfish.com. I've got a I've got a uh, data feed at peakfish.com, which people uh, are subscribing to and enjoying. And uh, you can just get really nice looking charts on uh, global natural resources uh, at peakfish.com. Excellent. Gregor, always a pleasure to talk to you. And pleasure we'll see you again. Okay.